Well, hello everybody. Good morning, good evening, good night. I hope that you guys are gonna enjoy this one because not too long now after AMD announced their Radeon 7900 series and the RTX 4080 12 gigabyte basically being yanked right out of the market before it was even launched, it's pretty obvious that Nvidia has a ton riding on this guy, the RTX 4080 16 gigabyte. But anyways, I did not want this video to be your bog standard review. No way, I think we're pretty much done with those, so I wanna throw a couple of little twists into it. The first thing that I wanted to do is overclock this to see at stock settings and increased frequencies if this is actually worth the $1,200. That's $1,200 that Nvidia is asking for it. So anyways, let's just get right into this with what you need to know. First of all, the 4080 Founders Edition uses the exact same design as the RTX 4090. So it's a triple slot monster that looks more like a brick than a GPU. I'm still digging this design, but man, does it take up a crap ton of space. Yet considering this thing has a T GP of 320 watts or 130 watts less than the 4090, well a cooler like this is a bit overkill, which could either be a good thing if you care about temperatures, overclocking and noise, or a really, really bad thing if you're space constrained. I should also mention that this god awful thing, this quad 8 pin connector to 16 pin connector is gone. It's gone. Boom. In its place is, oh geez. All it is is a 3 8 pin to single 16 pin connector. You are not really saving anything here because this thing is still a pain in the ass to cable manage and it looks it looks terrible, doesn't it? So it really would be worth your while if you're spending this kind of money on a GPU to see if there's a native 16 pin connector for your power supply. Pricing for the 4080, well, it's $400 less than the RTX 4090, but don't celebrate yet because remember the RTX 3080 launched at 800 bucks before scalpers got a hold of it. So this thing sets a new high water mark for a non TI GPU. And in the future, that might pose a huge problem for Nvidia since it's no secret AMD's laser targeting their less expensive 7900 XTX and XT right at the 4080. The all new H7? What's not to like? It's like a perfectly tuned guitar or a sharpened knife, keeping the user happy and your hardware safe. The best part is the redesigned interior that is full of potential with 360 rad support at the top and front, including 140mm mounts, a totally new cable management system and cable bar with of course vertical GPU support with this Gen 4 PCIe riser kit. The 3K styles are made to suit your needs with the flow being my favorite. I think this is the way to full tower your next build. Check out the new H7 when your heart desires. Anyways, with that out of the way, I think it's time to start down our little overclocking journey here with power consumption because believe it or not, the RTX 4080 will buck a lot of people's preconceptions about how much power it actually chugs down. That's because it might have a TGP of 320 watts, but that doesn't necessarily mean it actually needs 320 watts to operate in games. Because when we look at how it behaves in all 13 games we test, it only hits above 300 watts in four of them, and it never comes close to 320 watts. As a matter of fact, on average, it used just over 270 watts. Adding ray tracing to that bumps things up a bit more in some games, but nothing goes over 310 watts. This just goes to remind you that Nvidia uses TGP as an absolute maximum, not an average power consumption. So even without really doing much, there's obviously some headroom here when it comes to overclocking. But Nvidia does limit you in some ways. So first of all, your GPU core frequencies and your memory frequencies are pretty much open, but the power limit only gets a 10% increase at the most. Not only that, but like with almost every single other Nvidia card out there right now, they are limiting the amount of voltage that you can pump into this. So you'll almost always be voltage limited to 1,110 millivolts, at least for now an afterburner, since there's still power overhead to spare. Still, even with that, we are able to hit a stable clock speed of just over three gigahertz, while the memory leveled out at a constant 24.4 gigabits per second. Now, when I say stable, it was rock solid for about 14 hours of gaming during our benchmark runs, and that included some pretty intensive professional renders too. So with that, we're now seeing a lot more games inch closer to that 300 watt mark, while some actually start to head above 330 watts. Still, there's a bunch of titles here where Nvidia's boost algorithm determines our three gigahertz target is achievable with a lot smaller power increases. The same can be said 
said about ray trace situations, remember we're setting a power target here and it's up to the GPU to determine what it actually needs to hit a given frequency. And speaking of frequency, right out of the box, our RTX 4080 hit 2.7 gigahertz or above in every single game with some actually coming close to 2.8 gigahertz. Add our overclock to that and there's only two titles that come in just under the three gigahertz mark, Doom and RDR2. The overall heavier GPU loads in ray tracing brought a few more games just under 3 GHz, but regardless, every single game saw a clock speed increase of about 10%. Considering the cooler on the RTX 4080 FE was designed to handle much higher heat loads, temperatures at stock weren't a limiting factor and they definitely weren't when overclocked either. I mean, this is pretty nuts. Only one game went above 60 degrees. And for anyone wondering about noise, we left the fans at auto and speed increased from just 35% at stock to about 42% when overclocked. So the cards stayed whisper quiet even during the more intensive ray tracing loads. All right, so I guess that sets the stage for performance in stock form and an overclock form of the RTX 4080 against all of its competitors, but there are a couple of housekeeping items that I wanted to get off the table and sort of like off my shoulders. So first of all, yes, we were able to increase clock speeds by 10%, but, and this is something that keeps on getting forgotten by a bunch of people, a 10% increase or whatever percent increase in clock speeds does not equal a parallel 10% increase in frame rates. That is completely impossible. There's a lot of other factors going into this equation. The other thing that I needed to mention is I just feel that right now, these benchmarks, they just paint a very incomplete picture because one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle, which is the RX 7900 series, is just missing. It's coming out in a couple of weeks. So right now you're going to see how the 4080 performs against the current competition, but the competition before the end of the year is going to be completely different. All right, I'm sorry, let's pause right here to set things up visually because going forward, the green bar is going to be the RTX 4080 at its stock speeds, while the orange bar represents our manual overclocks frame rates. Either way, the stock RTX 4080 gets off to a strong start over the 3090 Ti and 3080 Ti. Just a small thing to note here is the 3090 Ti is the Strix liquid cooled model, which is one of the fastest ones around. Overall, in these titles, the RTX 4080 leads the RTX 3080 Ti by at least 30% and sometimes a fair bit more. Against the RTX 3090 Ti, well, it's a heck of a lot closer. And in a few situations, the RX 6950 XT actually gets pretty darn close to that stock 4080. And remember, that plucky AMD card is going for under 800 bucks right now. Meanwhile, the RTX 3080 Ti's are still going for over a grand. And on the side of overclocking, it does bring frame rates a bit closer to the RTX 4090, but ultimately that card stays dominant right across the board. There's also some games here that struggle to have any differentiation between the slowest and fastest GPUs be it due to game engine limitation or something completely different. Then there's CSGO, and it's a game where the RTX 4000 series chronically underperforms. Nvidia is aware of this and they're looking into it, so hopefully we're gonna see some improvements later on. Meanwhile, Valorant sees a nice little game engine cap on performance, but the overclocked RTX 4080 does end up getting a bit higher frame rates. And I know a lot of you are about to bring this up, so I may as well head you guys off at the pass. Yes, these frame rates are all above and well above a typical monitor refresh rate that you have right now. So I guess a lot of you are wondering like what the heck is even the point of running at these high frame rates? So to me personally, I think this is more about future proofing because if anything, game technology is progressing and this is all about where performance will be in a couple of years where hopefully you guys are still using this card and are getting playable frame rates. But then again, there's also 4K, so let's get to that. Well, the RTX 4000 series issues we're seeing with CSGO persist here, but we're still at a super high frame rate anyways. And the same thing goes for Valorant too. Then there's a bunch of games where the RTX 4080's lead over the 3080 Ti ends up widening by a fair amount since its new architecture gets to flex its muscles. You also have to take into account that at 4K clock speeds start taking a bit of a back seat, so the overclock clock settings have less of a benefit here. There's some increases for sure, but they're a bit less than they were at 1440p. It's not all roses and sunshine for the 4080 
either. Because there's also some games that see its lead over the 3080 Ti, 3090 Ti, and even the 6950 XT start to shrink in a pretty substantial way. What we might be seeing is the wider 384-bit memory interfaces of previous generation NVIDIA cards, and maybe to a lesser extent, the Infinity Cache on RDNA 2 starting to flex their muscles over the RTX 4080's 256-bit interface. That would also explain why the RTX 4090 is so absolutely dominant here. It's in a completely different league. Of course, I also wanted to talk about ray tracing since it's so obviously such a big focus for NVIDIA at this point. And it's also looking more and more like game developers might be catching on too. Either way, we already know this will be a huge win. And it really is, no matter which way you look at things, against the RTX 3080 Ti, 3090 Ti, and of course the 6950 XT, the RTX 4080's lead is leaps and bounds higher than it was during our standard game testing. There is one small thing I wanted to point out though, and that's the Far Cry performance of our RTX 3080, which was a abysmal since we might have actually hit a VRAM limitation. All right, so the last stop in this little tour of ours is, guess what? Professional application performance of the RTX 4080 because I'm sure a lot of you guys are not just using this for gaming. When you're buying a $1,200 plus GPU, you probably want it to do a bunch of other things, including GPU compute. So let's check that out too. So here's the deal. The RTX 4080 is fast in GPU compute workloads. I mean, really, really fast to the point where it just runs all over the 3090 Ti and in some cases can even chew through tasks a bit faster than the RTX 4090. There's two other things. First and foremost, overclocking does very little to nothing in these professional apps. Also, AMD's architectures really suffer here with either poor overall performance or just a complete lack of app support. In Resolve and Premiere, you also need to take into account none of the files we're using takes advantage of NVIDIA's dual NVENC engines. And once that starts to roll out more broadly, the speedup will be even larger here. All right, that's it. And I guess I threw a bunch of information at you guys in a very short period of time. So what I wanted to do at this point in time is I wanted to summarize all of our performance results, sort of compile those into three charts here. So the first one is going to be 1440p, overall average performance of all the 13 games, 4K and also ray tracing. And at 1440p without RT enabled, our 13 game average isn't all that great for the RTX 4080. To put it into context, we're talking about 15% better than the 3080 Ti, while the 6950 XT and 3090 Ti get even closer. But there's two things you need to take into account. A, the dreadful CSGO performance drags it down a bit here, and we're also hitting a game limitation in Valorant. Its lead doesn't move whatsoever at 4K either. If anything, some of the gaps we saw at 1440p narrow even further because of the RTX 4080 spotty performance in Forza, Warhammer, and Horizon Zero Dawn. And yet, when you switch gears to ray tracing, you can see why NVIDIA is pimping this so much for the 4000 series. What was a few percentage improvement over the 3080 Ti is now almost 35%. So at this point in time, I think it's pretty obvious where the performance focus for the RTX 4000 series really, really lies, and that's in ray tracing performance. In a lot of ways, increasing the ray tracing performance the way NVIDIA has, has basically allowed them to drag raster performance along for the ride and sort of increase that as well. You can see that very, very well when it comes to the RTX 4090. But the RTX 4080, on the other hand, that's where there's a couple of little problems here, because even when overclocked, ray tracing is really the only place that it truly shines. Otherwise, it just struggles to consistently outperform something like the RTX 3080 Ti by a significant amount. Yes, sometimes it's way better, but most of the times it's a low double digit increase. And that's a massive problem for a $1,200 GPU that's being launched a year and a half after a card Nvidia keeps comparing it to. So here's my recommendation right now, point blank. If you want high level ray tracing or you think that you're going to want to enable ray tracing in the future in as many games as possible, then the RTX 4090 and the RTX 4080 are the cards that you're probably gonna want. And as a matter of fact, you may as well just spend the additional money on the RTX 4090 to get that kind of crazy uplift in performance 
over the 4080. On the flip side of that coin, maybe you're just ambivalent about the whole ray tracing conversation. You might even think that I mentioned that technology way too much in this conclusion already, and you want the best possible raster performance for your money in the ultra high-end GPU space. Heck, even with that, you might wanna dabble in ray tracing a little bit in the future. It is completely worth your while to wait just a bit to see what AMD is coming out with. Because right now, this conversation is almost incomplete without talking about the 7900 series. And once we know where those things lie, you are going to be able to make a more informed decision. And that is probably the most important takeaway from this whole video. So anyways, I am Mike with Hardware Canucks. I hope you enjoyed this content and I'm going to see you in the next one. Have a great day, guys.